God, and thank you because you chose us. We didn't choose you. We thank you and we praise you, Lord God, that you look beyond our sin. You reached down and you met us right where we were. We thank you and we praise you, Father God, that even now, you continue to forgive us of our sins. Those that we, as we confess our sins, those sins that are known as well as the ones that are unknown, Lord, we ask forgiveness for it in Jesus' name. Just as we have already forgiven all those that have sinned against us, that have offended us, that have mistreated us, that have talked about us, misused us, Lord, we release them, we forgive them. And Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we just ask you to have mercy upon them. We ask you to bless them, Lord, exceedingly abundantly beyond anything that we could think to ask for ourselves. Meet them right where they are, Lord God. Father God, it's not in the name of Jesus that we ask your blessings upon our pastor and his wife while they are away, Lord. Bless them abundantly right where they are. Keep them safe and free from all hurt, harms, and dangers, seen and unseen, Lord. Replenish their strength as the eagles, Father, we ask you in Jesus' name. Give our pastor a double portion of an anointing, Lord, and we thank you for it, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for the First Lady that undergirds him. We thank you for his family, Father. We thank you, Lord, for the word that you've given him to minister to your people here at the stop. We thank you, Father God, for the disciples and members that are coming into the, to the congregation from the south, from the west, from the east, and from the north. We thank you, Lord, that they're just running in. We thank you, Lord, for words of comfort that he gives to the members here, Father God. And now, Lord God, it's in Jesus' name. We lift up every member within the congregation that is afflicted with any type of physical and or mental challenge, any type of challenge, Lord. Father, you said that we should ask in the name of Jesus and whatever we ask, you would give it to us. And we ask right now, Lord God, that your healing is manifested in each and every one of our bodies according to your word, and we thank you for it, Lord. Father God, I thank you that I have been selected as your chosen vessel to bring the word tonight, Lord. Father, and I just thank you that as I die out so that you can rise up in me, Father. It's your word, Lord. I listen for your word, not mine, but your word. Speak through me, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, we give you all of the praise and we give you the glory for the word tonight. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good evening. Good evening. Praise God. Yes? Oh, good evening. Good evening to everyone. It's good to see all of you guys again tonight. Amen. Thank you for the word. Thank you for that wonderful praise and worship service. You know, it's just something about praising God that uh, when you praise him from the depths of your heart, you just, you're, you're not the same anymore because you just, the anointing just come down upon you and um, it's just a difference in your yeah, feeling. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you, you think of all of the good things, the goodness of God, you think of who we are, where he met us, when we were there, how he reached down and he picked us up, and how he has walked with us and he has brought us to where we are now. And you just can't stop thanking him enough and praising him enough and giving him the glory because it's not us, it's him. Um, we're gonna continue to talk on uh, study John 15, 16, if you'll turn there with me. We've been taught, pastor's been talking about it now for about two months, six to eight weeks. And I have, this is my third time before the ladies and the second time before the full congregation, and I have been talking about it. John is really um, an amazing chapter when you study it, study the scripture, and as you get into it, for me, uh, just to see how God 
in his divine wisdom, how he has chosen us. Listen, are you to John 15, 16? Okay, the scripture reads, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordain you, thank you, that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should return, remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now we've talked about uh, the purposes for why God has chosen us. He chose us to be ambassadors. That means that we're his representatives in the world. We go out into the highways and to the byways. We start at home. We go out into our community and our neighborhood and our city on our job. Wherever we go, we're, we're his ambassadors. We're his representatives. And we're to represent him in, in, a, in a godly way. People should know that we're his representatives, not so much by what we, what we say, but how we carry ourselves. And how we carry ourselves in addition to what we say, they just know. And it's not always talking about the word of God. It's just those characteristics of a Christian that we have. So we're his ambassadors. And then the second purpose that God chose us so that we could bear fruit. What is the fruit that we're supposed to bear? Godly character, the fruit of the spirit, that's right. And now tonight we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about to receive the things of God. That's the last sentence here. It says, I think that's the B portion, C portion. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So now we are on the receiving end. We are ambassadors, we bear fruit, and then the word tells us, the last portion of this, this verse here tells us that we are to receive of God. However, before we can receive, there is a big if, two letter word. It's conditional. You know, uh, many times people will take the word and say, well, God said this and God said that. God said if I ask, he would give it to me. But it's conditional. Back up to verse 7, same chapter. And it reads, if that's conditional, that means that you have to do something before you can receive it. If you abide, that means that if you stay, if you continue, if you live, if you rest in me, if you stay in me, if you remain in me, and my word remain in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, we have, so what, where do, how do we get to that point? We have to begin, first of all, by studying. Studying the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us, to study, to show ourselves approved of God, rightly dividing his word. Rightly, that means not misinterpreting it, but looking up the words, looking up the scriptures, seeing what the, what the words mean, because as I don't know if all of you know, but I'm sure some of you do, if not all of you, that the same one word in this scripture can mean something totally different in a different scripture. So if you have your, your concordance with you, if you have your biblical dictionary with you, well, let me see what it means in here because it may not mean the same thing. The whole, it, and that one word meaning something different in another scripture will change the whole context of what it is. So we have to study and learn the word of God. How are we going to know how to live, what to do, if we don't know what God's word says? So we have to study to show ourselves approved. We have to change our thoughts and desires. We have to have it, we have to control our words. You know, um, just because we're Christians, well, just because I'm a Christian, it doesn't mean that all of my thoughts are holy. So we have to control our thought life. 
You know, when that thought come in there, that thought that is not lining up with scripture, we have to take control of it. You know, over in, I believe over in the book of Corinthians, first or second, I'm not sure, I can't remember, but it says that we are to pull down every thought, every idea, every suggestion that exalts itself above the word of God. So if those thoughts come in there, and, and, and it doesn't, you know, you can, I can just, we can just look in one and say, mm. And the thought that goes with it may not be the best thought that there is. Or maybe someone at work, your, your, your boss, your supervisor, or whomever give you instructions, or a coworker will ask you to do something and will do something. And the thought that you have may not be such a nice thought. How about when those, whenever the, the, the offenses come, because that's what they are, when the offenses come, bless them, Lord. Bless them exceedingly abundantly. Control that thought, because if you think on it, then you will allow, you, your mind will begin to go off in different directions, in wrong directions, that's contrary to what scripture says. We have to be motivated and controlled by the word of God. Well, how can you be motivated and controlled by the word of God if you don't know the word of God? When we study the word of God, when we learn the word of God, when we control our thoughts and our desires, and when we are motivated because we know the word of God, then we meet the criteria of if. Because if you stay in the word of God, you know there, we talked about the vine and the branches and how uh, some of the branches, once they are, they're still connected to the, to the vine, However, because they have not stayed strongly attached to the vine, that they're pruned off. Well, see, that's what happens to a lot of, of uh, Christians. They come in with a lot of zeal and a lot of motivation, but the cares of the world, their thought life uh, is not controlled. You know, when we come in out of the world, simply because we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, we've confessed him as Lord of our life, it doesn't change those thoughts and it doesn't change those feelings. The only thing that is going to change it is studying the word of God and then when you study the word of God, you put it into practice. There are many people that know the word of God. They can quote scripture beginning at Genesis 1 to the last chapter in Revelations. But then they have no control over their thought life. They will quote scripture to you and then turn around and call you everything but a child of God. That's not controlling your thought life. They will repent, so they say. And, and, and you know, when you say well, repent, it means turn away. Well, they'll turn away, but they haven't changed their mind about what they're doing. So repenting really is changing your mind about a wrong lifestyle about what you're doing, about what you're talking about. I changed my mind according to God's word. It's wrong for me to gossip. It's wrong for me to, to lie. It's wrong for me to uh, tear down my brother or my sister. I turn away from that. I turn away from the other things that I'm doing, that now that I'm a child of God and I'm studying the word of God, I know that those things don't line up, line up with what God is saying that, that it should line, how I should line up with it. So I'm confessing and professing, but I'm not living. So what kind of witnesses are we then? We're not, we're not a witness. Remember in the beginning I told you that uh, as, as believers, as Christians, as ambassadors, Wherever we go, we represent God. It's not representative of him when we're not living a godly lifestyle. We must ask, we bet we're at if, if we don't ask God for whatever our, whatever our desires are or our needs, if we don't ask him in the name of Jesus, guess what? What does the word say? We don't get it. Jesus was talking to the disciples here. Uh, from 13, 14, 15, and 16, he, it was just, that was uh, right there at the Lord's Supper just before the crucifixion, and he was telling the disciples all of the things that his father had told him. 
And he said, in that day you will ask nothing, ask me nothing, but you will ask everything in my name and I will do it. He will do it because he is God, he said. And then he said, the Father will do it because you're asking in my name. If we meet the condition, if we are living Christ-like, if we are not asking amiss. Sometimes, you know, again, because of lack of knowledge, because of not widely dividing the word, people pray and say, well, Lord, you told me I could ask anything in your name and you would do it, but I'm asking amiss. I'm asking for things that, doesn't, that, that, that are not lining up with the word of God. So guess what's going to happen? Your prayer is not going to be answered. It won't be answered. It has to line up with the word of God. Whatever we ask for, we have to believe also that we receive. Do you know that many people pray and ask for things and, and when it's done, when they're finished praying, you can, um, I don't know if you've experienced it, but we pray for healing. We pray for deliverance. And then immediately after church, Oh, you know I'm sick. Oh, Arthur's got me. My back is hurting. Uh, you know I got the flu. I got the TB. I got the AIDS. I got the whatever else that they confess. But you just sit up here and you pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I received my healing according to your word. Your word tells me that we were healed by the stripes of Jesus. So if we were healed, I am healed. Now, you just cancel out your prayer by the words that you speak. I'm not saying you don't have pain. I'm not saying that the doctor has not diagnosed. That's what the doctor said. But what did Jesus say? There's two reports. There's the doctor's report, and then there's God's report. Whose report do you choose to believe? Whose report are you going to confess? We're in this world and our body is greatly challenged. We're bombarded with all types of things in the environment. You know, the food that we put in our body, the pesticides and the herbicides and the every other kind of side and the, the whatever else that they want to put in it. That has an impact upon our body and our body break down. But Jesus said that we were healed by his stripes. So we go to the doctor, we get the diagnosis, and we take the medication and we pray over it that we come against every, anything and everything in that medicine, that negative side effects on our body, and we continue to confess God's word of our body. When we pray, believe that we receive. And then again, I, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to state it again, it's in 1 John 14, 15. If we ask whatever we ask according to God's will, he hears us. So if, do you think that he hears us when we're not asking according to his will? Let's turn over there and let's see what else it says. That's 1 John 5, 14, 15. That's the B portion of it. You know, that was a question that I didn't ask myself as I was studying because I didn't look at it. First John 5, 14, whoever has it can start reading it, please. Okay, go ahead. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire from him. Okay. So he hears us if we ask in his name, according to his will. And that's a key word, because as I stated earlier, so many times we pray amiss, we don't pray God's word. We pray what we want to pray, and it's not according to his will. We have to be in his perfect will when we pray in order for him to answer our prayers. Okay, we talked, we, uh, the attached branch glorifies God by bearing much fruit. Okay, and that fruit, when others see fruit in the life of a believer, they are forced to acknowledge that only God's power could do such a thing. 
Now the characteristics, one of the fruit is, is righteousness, another of, of the fruit is uh, godly characteristics, and I believe one of the gentlemen up here said it, that's in Galatians uh, 5, 22 and 23. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, contrary to what many believers know or believe and or believe, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit will come to live in us, and these are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, they may not be in operation. We know. For many, they're not, because what are the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, Peace. Have you ever seen anybody that they, you just never see a smile on their face? I mean, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, it's prune face. But joy is one of the fruit of the, the Spirit. Have you ever been around anyone, observed anyone where they're, in, they're always in, their life is just chaotic? There's no peace. Lord, we jumped all over love, and we sure know a lot of our sisters and brothers in Christ that have no, that do not demonstrate love. But they have the fruit of the, the Spirit. They receive that fruit of the Spirit when they receive their salvation. Then we have gentleness, meekness, long-suffering. You don't see too many gentle people. You don't see too many meek you know, people that are meek, in other words, that are humble. You know, I was watching um, Dr. Carson on The View today. Such a humble man. I don't know if any of you guys saw it, or have you seen him during the primaries? Such a humble man, but a strong man of God. He comes across, and he's very, very well outspoken, and I was so amazed because before I thought, and this is a sidebar. He's not going to make it because he doesn't say anything. But he's just gentle. He's humble. He's meek. You know, and he sits there. But when he opens his mouth, the words pour out with such confidence. And it's according to Scripture. Now, we may not agree with everything that he says, but the things that he say, according to Scripture, are right on target. Then we have, um, we have love, joy, peace. We have gentleness, meekness, and long-suffering. And then we have faith, and we have temperance, which is self-control. Now, it's not a lot of self-control exhibited within the body of Christ. And Lord God, long-suffering, not for a minute, not, not too long. And these are our characteristics. These are godly characteristics. This is part of the fruit that we as believers should be exhibiting. Forgiveness. Long-suffering, long-suffering. Fifteen minutes, it's over. But there's no limit. Just think, you know, when I look at the fruit of the Spirit, these are all of the, the characteristics of God. The love that he had, John 3, 16 the joy that we have, the peace that he gave us. Jesus says, I came that you may have peace and have it more abundantly. His peace he leave with us, his gentleness, his goodness. Even when Judas betrayed him, he didn't go off on him. He was just gentle and meek and humble. He said, I came to do the will of my father. He was meek and he had self-control. Many, many times uh, when he went before the council, he'd never said a mumbling word. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. And then, according to Romans 1.13, we are to win converts, the fruits of the, of the Spirit. The fruit that we're to, con the, I'm sorry, not the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit that we are to produce. Fruit of righteousness, godly character, and then we are to win converts. Romans 1.13 says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was not let hither 
too, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So this is Paul that's talking. You know, he wanted to have fruit among the brothers there, um, and so he wasn't able to come, but he, he knew that he had that fruit there, that they were able to carry on the work that he wasn't there to do. There are ways to tell if a person, any Christian, really is attached to Christ, that if he really does have the fruit of the, of, of, uh, the Spirit working in him, that if he's bearing fruit, we're to bear fruit as Christians. You can look at the way a person lives. Is he living righteously outside of church once they go through those double doors? Sometimes we don't make it through the sanctuary. Lord, pray for us on the sidewalk and on the way to the parking lot. And what happens when you're away from everybody? Are you still living Christ's life? Does one lead others, the unsaved, to Jesus Christ? Are you ministering? Are you witnessing to the people that you talk to? You know, with my grandchildren especially, when, when my children were coming up, I wasn't rooted and grounded in the Word, but with my grandchildren, when they were here, every time they bring a friend over, I'd talk and then I'd ask them, I need to ask you a question. Oh, Granny. Well, I needed to know if they were saved. And, and I just ask, are you saved? What does that mean? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Well, you can do it right now. We need to, part of, 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 of the Great Commission is that we go out, what well, the Great Commission is that we go out into the highways, into the byways, to the uttermost parts of the earth, and we tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Why did he come? He came so that we, we could be reconciled back to God, the only way that we could be reconciled back to him. So how do we get reconciled? By receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior and allowing him to be the Lord of our life. That's our assignment. And an awesome assignment it is. And if we fail to do that, then we miss the whole purpose of our calling. You know, we have family, we have friends, we have um, co-workers, we have foes that have not heard the word. We're to go, we're to tell them about Jesus Christ. If we don't tell them, how can God draw them to him? Speak the word, share it in love, We are chosen and appointed for three reasons, and I'm just about finished. Praise God. This is the end of my, well, I won't say the end of my study, but these are the three things that I really focused upon. We are chosen to be ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ. You know, you've heard that phrase, ambassadors for Christ. That's who we are. Everywhere we go, we're representing, representing. You've heard, I've heard that phrase, thing, I'm representing. Are we really representing Christ in an excellent manner? Are we winning people into the body of Christ? And are we displaying godly characteristics? Are we walking in the fruit of the Spirit? Are we, is it a part of our lives? And I, you know, just be honest to yourself. I don't want anybody to ask that. You know, at one time I used to think that you couldn't have all of the fruit. That's what I was taught where I came from. That you could only have some of them. But the fruit is in us. Have you ever heard anyone say, well, I just can't, I just can't, uh, I, I just can't be nice. I just can't, I just can't control myself. Or I'm just not long suffering. Well, those are the fruit of the spirit that's in you so they need to be developed so we need again there's a teaching tool we need to teach our brothers and sisters in Christ know that they're there but you just have to develop them and it's not easy not easy for me anyway sometimes it's hard to be long-suffering 
Sometimes it's very hard and very difficult for me to control my time. But we're to control our thought life. We're not to just speak the first thing to come to our mind as ambassadors for Christ. We are to bear the fruit of righteousness. We are to live our lives, and some of us, maybe, I was probably, I was one of those, lived a life that when your friends see you, they said, I don't believe that's her. Because I was just so mean and so hateful. And then there are other people that they, you know, they do what they do, they are what they are, and they did it so well, and when somebody tell you, well, honey, you know, he's, that he's going to church and she's going to church. What? Not him. Well, only God can do that. God changes us. But somebody had to tell him. I was listening to uh, a minister on TV, and he was saying, I think it was on TV or I read it someplace, that there was this, this um, Christian, this man that had prayed for a friend of his. They were ex real good, close friends. And then the one friend got saved, and the other one didn't. So the one that got saved prayed for his friend for 63 years to save his, for him to receive his salvation. That friend made the transition, was home in glory. And another friend that, know, that knew about this friend that constantly prayed and, in, and interceded on behalf of his friend to receive his salvation happened to see him at the cemetery. And he was kneeling at the grave of the friend that had prayed for him. And at that grave, he accepted Jesus Christ as his savior. Now that's supposed to be a true testimony. 63 years, you know, we give up after a little while. Oh, Lord, <laughs> he's beyond help. But we, we continue to intercede on behalf of our loved ones, on behalf of our enemies. Just God's word is true. When you pray, believe that you receive. And he says that he, he does not, his desire is, not, is that not one man, woman, or child be lost. That's his will. But again, he created us in his image, right? And when he created us in his image, what did he do? We have a... And that choice comes from, we have a will. He gave us choice. He doesn't force us to do anything. But if we intercede, if we continue to intercede, if we witness, if we live our lives before our family, before our friends, before our co-workers, before uh, Joe Blow and, and Jane on the street, and we, we just walk with the love, the love of Jesus Christ, the way that he walked, people will see us and begin to touch to take notice. We touch lives every day. We don't know whose lives we touch. I believe Pastor was, was speaking on that on Sunday or maybe in the leadership meeting. We don't know whose lives we have touched for we've made a difference or whose lives that we have crossed and we didn't reach out and minister to them in whichever way the Holy Spirit led us, that would have made a difference to keep that person from um, maybe having not made a choice to, to prevent that person from, I'm just going to say it, busting hell wide open. Just tell the truth. Just tell them about Jesus. We, Jesus didn't force himself upon anybody, and we're not to do it. Our, our responsibility is to tell them. And when we tell them, then the Holy Spirit woos and draws them to God. And then he does the rest. So we have the easy part. But we got to tell them. We have to tell our children at home. We have to teach them. In this day and time, with all that is going on, with wrong decisions being made, ungodly decisions being made uh, by the highest court in the land and all of this other stuff that is going on, the stuff that you see on TV, Lord help me. What it is is that it's subliminalization for our children. It's conditioning them to be accepting of the lifestyles that contradicts God's word. God tells, you know, his word tells us that we are to obey man and his laws. 
until it contradicts his word. Then we're to obey God. But when, when the children are there, they even have the little cartoons with the dirty little stuff in there. And Lord, help the children with the iPhones and the iPads and all of this other stuff that we can't control. Long ago, I gave up on mine because she would flip them little fingers and I couldn't figure out what she was doing. And it goes by so fast. But you know, we as parents and grandparents, we need to become more knowledgeable of the technology today so that we can better control what our children are, what they are being exposed to. The TV programs, there's not too many that's worth anything on TV anymore. And I mean, you know, there was a time, uh, probably nobody but Sister Green and Sister Scott and Sister Wins, you know, way back there, T and, and Sister Bertha, you know, they would bleep out words over the airwaves. You know, certain songs that would be sung, and then there were certain songs that just couldn't come up there, period. But now, everything goes, anything goes. And, and, and you know, I, I think that we as Christians are not doing our part. Because we take it, we allow it to happen. You know, everybody is, uh, is um, going to court taking legal actions for their rights. What about our rights? We have rights too, but we don't say anything. Now Jesus sat there and he didn't say a word, but he was on a mission, he had a mission. We're supposed to speak up, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. But we don't say anything. We allow them to push anything and everything off on us, take, er any, take everything away from us. All I have a right. If you don't want to pray, then don't pray, but don't keep me from praying. You know, I see your religion. Okay, I don't receive it, but that's you. Now, given the opportunity led by the Holy Spirit, I'm going to drop a seed. But I'm not going to try to take your rights away from you. The rights that should be taken away, they're leaving them there. If they take these guns away from these people, some of this killing would stop. All of it would stop. I mean, just take them. Just take them. Just make it. Well, anyway, Father God, it's in Jesus' name. I just praise you and I thank you for your word. Your word is true, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you chose us. We did not choose you. I thank you, Father God, that you ordained us. You, you took us and you placed us in a special ministry. I thank you for your word, Father God, that commands us to go out into the highways and to the byways to tell them about your son, Jesus Christ. Father God, I just thank you and I praise you for Holy Ghost boldness to saturate this, uh, every person that is here tonight so that when they leave here, Lord, they will leave with a special anointing. A special anointing to tell everyone that they come into contact with about Jesus, your son, our savior. Father, we thank you for your love that was so great that you gave the best that you had to give so that we could be reconciled back to you, Father. We thank you for that. We praise you, Lord, because you're so worthy to be praised. We will always lift up your name. And it's in Jesus' name.